when I was pitch side, and again, the listeners, I've mentioned this loads, but I want to talk to you about it because you're better placed than me, especially where you were as well, obviously watching it. I don't know where you were. Were you there for the quarterfinals of the World Cup? Uh, no, I, I was there for the semis and final. Didn't make so, out okay. for the quarters. Same thing. Okay, so once we got to them quarters in Paris and the semis and the finals carried on, I was pitch side and I had never seen beautiful chaos and violence oh, and speed and power. And I was like, even now I get goosebumps thinking about it because we've been there and done it. You've done it at a higher level than me and they're doing it at a higher level than we've done it now because the game's come on so much. And I've taken so much kind of backlash. And this is from everyone, from owners of clubs, uh, from commercial sponsors, from people at World Rugby when I've had conversations before, friends, people walking down the street where I'm saying that rugby players are underpaid. And, oh, what do you mean? But there's clubs going under. This is happening. This is happening. The game isn't commercially viable. And yet I say to them, I don't care. that I can't control the commerciality of the game. I can't control sponsors. I can't control how the narrative of our game is spoken about in public forums in the media to the wider audience and I can't control younger grassroots kids playing rugby in schools and whether or not games are cancelled they should be playing more games etc I said what I can control is my tone of voice when I speak about on a podcast and more so than ever I'm there for the quarterfinals and I'm looking round, and it was a gladiatorial feel it was like Maximus Decimus Aurelius in the Colosseum, the the energy, <laughs> the floor was vibrating. Every seat was sold out. Every pub in Ireland was sold out. Every pub in New Zealand was sold out. In France, all the fan zones, in South Africa, mate. And I'm like, they're millionaire athletes that are doing that. As in, don't tell me that there's no money in the game. This yeah, stadium is sold out. Every corporate seat that is, what, 500 quid a ticket, 250 quid a ticket is sold out. Every pub is sold out. Don't tell me that there isn't any money in the game. It's crazy. Yeah. There, there might not be any money in the, in the tiers below that, I understand, and that's a different conversation. But the output of what we're seeing there compared to other sports, they are million-pound athletes doing that. Mate, this is why I, I think we need to celebrate it more. Like, mate, that... There was the, the very similar to the quarterfinals. Those quarterfinals were, which I loved. Uh, mate, they were ferocious. There was the, remember the, the Ireland South Africa pool game? Oh my God. I, I was in the studio watching that with Roy Best and Brian O'Driscoll. After five minutes, we looked at each other and we were just like, like, well, mate, we're used to it. We've played Six Nations international games and we're used to high level rugby matches with a lot of intensity. But I watched that. And we looked at each other and we were like, I was like, holy shit, I've never seen that in my life before. And because that's ITV, that would have been broadcast to however many million. You know, when we're doing club games, you might get a few hundred thousand watching. I remember thinking, there's probably about a million people watching rugby for the first time here. And they'll be watching going, oh my God, what is this sport? But like but what, like what you said, the, the risk that those players are... Uh, what what they're doing on that stage is phenomenal, and I think it's like a like mate. What else competes with that apart from obviously your other codes of rugby? But even the World Cup is just such a massive thing. I, I agree with you. I think what those players are, are going through is is amazing, and they and they're not celebrated enough, you know. So, um, I mean, what is such a good sport? And I think sometimes we're trying to protect it too much. I think as long as you get the message across, look, this is only at the top level, and you've got to remember the very top level. These players aren't just being parachuted from a local parks pitch. People say, "What? Why? Are, you know, is it really nerve wracking when you play them?" Like, look, you get you get physically conditioned over years and years to get to that level, and you mentally prepare for that because you gradually go through the ranks. You don't just get like parachuted in from playing your Division Five club team and suddenly you're in a World Cup final. Like those guys have taken all the necessary steps to get there, so it makes it way safer than people think. They're they're meant to be there. Their their bodies can cope with it. Of course, you're going to get accidents, and they're very few and far between. But I think the messaging around rugby is like, yeah, look, it's it's such an amazing high octane gladiatorial sport, which I don't think you get many spectacles around the sport and world like it I just think we need to celebrate that way more yeah and that's why I'm glad that guys like you doing BBC like you Barkley Ugo the way that it's spoken about the game as in the high energy and I wasn't I don't expect you to talk about this but we were talking about it at home with a couple of mates and I was watching it and I mentioned it on the rugby pod as well I'm watching the ITV game at the weekend so the Scotland Ireland game or Ireland Scotland game and the Six Nations is on the line. The Triple Crown is on the line. There's two minutes to go. 
and there's no energy. There's no energy in comms. There's no energy on the pitch. The ref's coming in to talk about the bunker, how it's not going to be a red card. I'm like, there's two minutes left in this game. Like, this is going down to the fucking yeah. wire. Like, w- w- there needs to be more hysteria. It needs to be, yeah. like, to really, really sell it. Because on the pitch, it is. That's what yeah. the players are feeling. And I just think we need to do more. And we need to really accelerate our storytelling, our narrative, yeah. and getting the very best people in them positions to sell our game. Because it feels like there is a bit of a desperation. Like, you see in Netflix and how that was kind of marketed and... You could see the desperation from the Six Nations sharing all the content. This kind of mass collaboration came all at once, which was a desperate move. I completely understand that, as opposed to like an authentic rise of collaboration. But that's good that we are collaborating. We're doing more, for sure. What was your thoughts on the Netflix documentary? Have you seen it? Six out of ten. Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, I was chatting to some people about this, and they were like, oh, yeah, it was really good. But I think if you're involved in rugby, you could you could tell where it got dramatised. Commentary was redone, wasn't the original commentary. Um, and I thought, oh, but I, I would much rather have seen, maybe it's because I've maybe seen some of the hard knock stuff growing up um, on the NFL. I would much, but I, I know it's all to do with access, but I would much rather see more team meetings, more training regimes. Um, the in-game footage is good, but like, like changing room shots. I know there's certain access and I wonder whether there could be like, some sort of control from the unions like that can go out that car and they can pre-approve things but i think to give more of that access i don't think like watching a player drink coffee with his wife talk about the game to be honest doesn't excite me right but i i'd much rather watch a driving mall session on a tuesday morning just after team selection and people can see the bite that those sessions have and how disappointed some players are that they're not selected versus the ones who are playing and the anxiousness they have prepping for a game. I'm like, that's a session I want to watch or that I think we should show, you know? So, yeah, I agree with you, six out of ten. There's still a lot of stuff we could show to sell it better, I think. Oh, a million percent. And I'm the same. Look, I started this eight years ago, Warby. So doing, I did a documentary on the bar bars behind the scenes of the Leicester Tigers Academy. And it all stemmed from watching Hard Knocks when I was young on the Arcos and looking at what other sports were doing. I love NFL, yet I hardly watch the game, right? I watch everything around it. I'm one of those that glitz in the glamour. You know, the the, the boxing, the 20 for 20 that they used to show on ESPN, I think it was called, and the embedded in UFC. They're normally better. The builder, UFC is a bit different. They're all generally pretty good fights, but the boxing build-up is generally better than the output on the pitch. And like, you know, I'm I'm speaking to the converted, like you, you see it the same way as me. And I just felt... Yes, we missed a trick uh, for the for bringing Netflix in. We're lucky that they've commissioned a second series. I'm hearing that there is more access, but we need to move away from this nicey, nicey stuff. Get the fucking cameras in the middle of the scrums, like you said, in the middle yeah. of the malls. You've got some of the biggest human athletes on the planet, the swearing, the jeopardy, the fights, the drama. And this is the thing, Warby. In our sport, it seems like... We don't embrace the drama, as in that the stuff that was happening around Wales with the players going on strike. That's what Formula One would have shown all of that. Football would have shown all of that. That's what people want to see. Well, like, how can you that. go from that drama, Bobby? How can you have that drama and then go and play a test match at the weekend? Like, who's controlling that? Who's speaking? I can only talk about my personal experiences. I'm not trying to make out this happened to just me because this would happen to a lot of rugby players. And again, hopefully this won't put people off the game, but it would make brilliant watching. And like, and let's be honest. Like I said, 99.9% of people aren't going to reach that level, so don't worry about it. But there was like a game I played in South Africa. But like, like I think showing this footage would be amazing. Like I had a big hit after about 28 seconds. Went, went into a tackle, massive hit. Remember, I like put my finger on my mouth. Finger was covered in blood, but I could feel all my teeth, you know. I was like, oh, this is weird. But anyway, I played the full game. Couldn't speak at the end of the game. When and spoke to the doctor, he grabbed and like imagine cameras are on this now. They can replay this by showing the hit, showing you carry on play. He, he he put his thumb somewhere on my jaw, made my knees hit the deck. I just dropped. He went right A and E straight away. Went to A and E, should show the X ray. Yeah, mate, you fractured your jaw. And then you know show the operation, play it in your jaw. Like this is against South Africa. I'm like I don't know, but like you watch yes. that, I'd be like mate, that would be watching a player go through all that, watching the scans, watching the X-ray, watching the medical treatment, watching the on-field hit, watching them play on. Then you go fair, fair play. People then you understand. Know? People then get yeah. it, 
and they'll understand yeah. what we are talking about. And that will be there soon. You know, like that yeah. will be there soon. You look at the World Cup when Bongi and Banambi goes off and that needs to be followed. Like he's off to hospital, yeah. he gets taken Big to hospital, he, he gets scanned. What's he done? He's fucked everything in his knee. Like as in, he is buggered and like, the, you know, they start x-raying bodies and, you know, desiccated elbows and desiccated shoulders and the stitches. Obviously the Lions in 97, that yeah. was all the stuff around Will Greenwood swallowing his tongue and Jono getting stitched up. Yeah, people love that, that. It's 30 years ago. You know, I it's know. crazy that there's been nothing nothing since. It's, but like, it's mental, you know, you, but that's our you game. Have, UFC don't paper over it. You know, they, they don't paper over it. They, 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 they embrace that, you know, and people love it. So, like I say, I, I think the game is actually safe. Uh, people might think I'm trying to make out it's this heroic, barbaric thing. I actually think the game is pretty safe. When you think that there are hundreds of collisions a game. It actually baffles me there aren't tenfold more injuries, you know? But I think people should take confidence in the fitness, the medical that attention that is around the game now, you know? So I, I don't want people to be scared of the game, but I think we that's why I agree with you, six out of 10 for Netflix. There's four out of 10, which are the those small snippets we've spoken about, which if they were shown alongside the training regimes, then I'd be like, now you're showing people what international rugby is all about you know and then people understand more when someone like an Owen Farrell decides to step away they go all oh, right yeah we know we, we've got a taste of what he's been through I get it I get it you know so I think that's the bit they don't show 